Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. After the tragedy of the Pinochet years, Chile had evolved into one of the most successful countries in the Americas, in economic terms, but perhaps more importantly, in terms of the health of its democracy. Right and left-wing parties and presidents alternated power, the judicial system worked, corruption was low, Chilean political leaders were respected at home and abroad. All of that came to a screeching halt in 2019, when protests over increased bus and subway fares escalated into widespread violence and a nationwide political crisis. Chile was suddenly at what in almost any other country would have been a revolutionary moment. However, instead of a civil war, the Chileans launched an inclusive political process to write a new constitution. They wanted to have a fundamental rethink as a nation of political rights, obligations, institutions, processes, democracy in action. Fast forward to September of this year, and the new constitution that was three years in the making was overwhelmingly rejected in a national referendum. What happened? What happens next? And perhaps most importantly, what lessons might other countries in the Americas and beyond draw from Chile's efforts to reimagine its democracy? Can a democracy fix what ails it? Today's guest on New Thinking for New World is well positioned to help us speculate. Isabel Aninat is Dean of the Law School of the Universidad Adolfo Ibenez and served as a presidential advisor on human rights and other issues that were addressed in the rejected constitution. Although I'm sure it wasn't her fault. (laughs) Welcome, Isabel. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Let's start with what happened. The morning after the referendum result was announced, the BBC headline was Voters Overwhelmingly Reject Radical Change. National Public Radio in the United States went with Chileans have rejected a new progressive constitution. Was the proposed constitution radical or progressive? What should the headline have been the morning after? The morning after? um, That's a great question, actually. I I would have... Phrase it this way. It's the return of the median voter. Um, so let me say why. We um, well, we went through this process, um, which was a very intense process in Chile. Chile became, uh, I would say, a constitutional-led discussion, um, both here and from people abroad. The only th- thing that we talked about for a year was about constitution. It was a great civic exercise. Uh, But at the same time, uh, we started thinking everything could be resolved through constitutional law. And if you ask any constitutional law professor, they would be a little bit skeptic about that. But why why would I say the return of the median voter? I would say that um, through many reasons, um, we in Chile have had a decline in in um, electoral participation. We have uh, voluntary voting for for many years now, since 2009. And and what we saw is that um, sort of the different political parties and the the political groups sort of rallied their supporters and and the people who um, work with them and, and, and tend to vote for them. But this this election was uh, under mandatory voting that was established from the beginning. Uh, and it was incredible that um, the we had 86% of electoral turnout. That for Chile is enormous. Um, and, and of those 86%, 62% uh, rejected it. And, and what you saw, I would say, in the days after is that... Um, people tended to say, yes, I like this idea or this other idea, but I'm worried about many other things. So it was um, the idea that uh, people are more complex and that, yes, we are worried about the environment. Yes, we're worried about gender. Yes, we are worried about animals, but we are also worried about 
water and 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 jobs and inflation. So so I would say that the median voter uh, shows that um, the complexity of people's lives, and and I I would say that that went through um, a lot of what has happened over the last few weeks after the referendum. So political process had become more about political activists and the constitutional question was put to everyone and that what you call the median voter suddenly engaged because she had to. It was obligatory. Yes, it was mandatory. Yes. And and said, wait a minute, this is either too much of this or too much of that. It is either too progressive or too radical or too whatever. We want something that is more centrist, whatever centrist might mean. Whatever centrist might be. Um, and and because, well, there, there's many things that went into the, the, the exit referendum. I would say that um, we have a very little functioning political system um, for, for many years now. So there's a lot of... Um, I don't know how to say it, but a lot of tied some with um, unresolved problems. And let me put just one example. We have been debating on a reform, on, on a big reform on the pension system for more than a decade. And that doesn't have gone through. We have been debating on a big reform on the health system for more than a decade, still pending. So there's a lot of that. And that has to do a lot, of course, with social rights. Um, on the campaign, there yes, there were um, fake news. It's important to say um, some people are trying to explain the result only based on fake news. I would say that that's not the case. But yes, there were fake news, as we've seen in I don't know any election now throughout the world. And um, just to see Brazil or or even the United States, I would I would say. Um, and but I I would also say that uh, that that the the idea of sort of putting um, a lot of things that are part of the Chilean um, constitutional tradition, which is valued and was sort of came forth with a lot of debate. For example, the flag. The flag became an issue. Um, and, and maybe it wasn't necessary to put, to, for it to become an issue. Uh, or the Senate. Um, the Senate, Chile has had the same type of Senate since the 19th century. There were um, some new ideas about how to put forward, but the final result sort of was a mix of many things. Another example, um, the judiciary. Uh, and I would say um, that a lot of those issues sort of raised questions about why are we doing this? Uh, is, is this really the problem? Uh, and so everything got questioned, everything got changed, many things got changed in its name, non, uh, and, and so that opened a lot of questions instead of saying, look, this is the roadmap, this is where we're going, this is the way forward. Um, instead, it sort of fragmented more the conversation. But it sounds like the process may have been almost too inclusive, and I don't mean too inclusive of people but too inclusive of issues and ideas, which is to say it, it became a paella. Everything got thrown in. Oh, oh, definitely. Um, but I would say, look, um, there were three main special rules uh, for the Constitutional Convention. So, so this was a Constitutional Convention of 155 people. In the end, it was 154. There was a, a person who got elected who had lied that he had cancer. He had campaigned on cancer and um, it was a lie. Um, so he got uh, voted out. Um, and that was uh, one scandal that made a lot of noise for the convention. Um, but the, the convention had three main rules that we had not had before in Chile. Um, one was a gender parity rule in its result. So it was half women, half men. I think that's great. The second one was um, inclusion of research seats for indigenous peoples. I also personally like the idea. But uh, there's a lot of debate of the number. There were 17 reserved seats. Um, and um, if you look at the electoral roll for the indigenous peoples, they are overrepresented on, those, on that number of seats. And the third rule, which I find much more conflicting, was um, a special rule which gave 
um, a lot of incentives for independence. Independence in Chile can run as independence on a party list. So you can go on, on a, a specific party as an independent. But then in this case, independent can run on their own list. So they could run on a list of independents, which is weird, right? Um, and so you got a very fragmented election. You got, I, if I remember correctly, 105 people who were independents out of 155. And so people came. It was very diverse. It was uh, more diverse than our congresses. Um, people came from different origins, different professions, uh, different cities in the country. All of the, uh, younger people. Um, all of that is good, uh, but at the same time, it generates complications. People had less political experience. Um, they didn't necessarily have a complete vision or a complete proposal for the constitution. Many of the people who got elected ran on issues. They were for X, Y, and C, the environment, um, sexual and reproductive rights, um, um, cities or issues with decentralization. But then in a constitution, you have to decide on the judiciary, uh, local governments, the general controller, um, the general principles. And so you need a whole view. And we that was very difficult to sort of put forward. This was not a convention that you had competing, opposing uh, projects. I would say you have you had uh, almost 155 possibilities. At the end, they started to group together and to, to do But imagine nego the negotiations, how hard they were. But the result was a constitution that had everything from soup to nuts. Well, you had um, a provision on books and a provision on energy, a provision on on food, on on that it was based on a blank slate, but under the idea that it shouldn't be a constitutional reform. But then that blank slate got extended. Um, to everything, and, and again, to the idea, because of where we were at that moment, that because we have had issues that haven't been addressed for so long, then this is the opportunity to address them. But let me undermine what you just said. This wasn't a constitutional reform. The old constitution was thrown out, in effect. It was start over from a blank, blank slate and write something that would be relevant to today and tomorrow but not necessarily rooted in the past. Well, the idea, yes, um, that was the, the, uh, the constitutional process is rooted on an agreement from the national, from the, all the political, almost, almost all the political parties, the Communist Party didn't sign, uh, almost all the, the political parties in uh, November of 2019. This was just after the social outburst when we had this um, Massive protests, but also massive violence. And so we channel it through this institutional reform. And some key provisions of that agreement, which was very dramatic, it was signed at 2.30 a.m. On, a on the morning, and we were all tense watching TV, um, was that this was a blank slate. So it was not a reform to the current constitution. Uh, our current constitution, we have reformed it many times. Um, we have included new things, new institutions, um, new uh, constitutional rights as well. Um, but, but this was the idea that, no, we should start again. Uh, and this, we had to do the change. Um, that was a key provision. And the other key provision was the quorum. It had a two-third quorum since, since the agreement. It's a high quorum. Um, but, but, uh, but, and, and we, we thought that it would work one way, but then uh, because of the electoral result, it ended up being like uh, reaching its quorum once again and again. Um, and, and that was hard for the negotiations. But at the same time, um, everything was possible. We, I must say, again, just um, very shortly, we have changed constitutions in Chile. This is not the first time that we've done it. Uh, so, so it's not that often, but we have, we did it and we, 
We did it in the 19th century. We had one that lasted many years from uh, 1833, but we changed it in 1925 and then in 1980. Um, no. We, we always had the military behind it, one way or the other. Um, not, not there. It, it depends on the moment. This was the first time that it was fully democratic, fully elected, fully inclusive. Um, but I would say that at the same time, we saw the problems that we have to pay much more attention on electoral design, um, or especially on electoral design, I would say. Something very boring and very technical. So the first time it's fully democratic, the process fails, uh, which, is, which is a bad sign. So the question becomes... What do you do next? What do we know do next? I think we we need a new constitution, and there's agreement on that. Um, the the it was interesting to see that the right, so the the political parties that are are uh, on the right, they campaigned saying um, not for this constitution, for a better one. So it was not against the idea of a new constitution. They change. They change the the idea of it's. It's just that this one is bad. Let's go. Let's give it another shot. Um, and so now, since um, September fifth, there have been uh, negotiations uh, in Congress led by the political parties. Um, I think uh, the negotiations have gone back and forth. I think we will have a constitutional process next year, twenty twenty three with um, le a, a reduced number of uh, people, so probably around, I don't know, between 50 and 100. Um, there's discussion, uh, probably there will be gender parity and inclusion of indigenous groups. Uh, I would say we will see less arrest role of um, favoring independence. And I... There's a discussion which is interesting, which is including more experts. And why? Because polls show, which is, I don't know why, or I have a theory why, um, that people are favoring a mixed, um, co a mixed convention. So fully ele uh, people elected and then experts. But this is the interesting part. When we started this process, we did an entry referendum. We had to vote on two votes. Do you want a new constitution? Yes or no? Yes, one. Uh, very big, almost 80%. And do you want a mixed convention or a fully elected? Fully elected one also uh, by a big majority. That's fascinating. It suggests that people looked around and said, oh, you actually need to know something. You need some expertise. You need some background. You need some technicians, for want of a better word, uh, mixed with, with the people uh, in order to produce a good result? Oh, yes, I would say that um, there were many lawyers in the Constitution, uh, in the Constitutional Assembly, I mean. Um, but uh, I would say that it's also the idea that we want a functioning body. Um, the, the convention was um, very interesting to watch, but also very, very confusing. It was very noisy, um, very noisy in every level, in, in the visual level, in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the way that people conducted their debates. We, it was the first time that you had a convention with this access to social media. And you saw um, those who got elected speaking with their iPhones, um, showing themselves to Instagram Live or Facebook or whatever. Um, so, so it was very noisy and very hard to read. Um, the votes where you, they voted, I don't know, sometimes 100 propositions in one afternoon. Um, and, and I would say that um, maybe behind this idea of experts is the idea of having a, a relatively functioning body that is more what we're used to the, to Congress, probably, where you have a, Standard procedure. It's all. It's noisy as well many times, but but the procedure is much. It's set right. 
If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org/donate. That's T A L L B E R G foundation.org/donate. Were ordinary people engaged in following the process as it as it evolved over the year, or was it just over there in a corner and the experts uh, were deeply interested? But in other words, did most Chileans engage on an ongoing way with the process? They had to vote at the end of the day, but were they was that median voter engaged at all during the process in terms of following what was going on? They were um, there were moments, I would say, um, for example, they did an exercise on public participation, which was very um, a, a new type of exercise in Chile. And you could uh, vote online and, 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 and send your ideas or vote for other people's ideas. And that had uh, a high level of participation that many expected. Um, but at the same time, what you saw and this you saw at the beginning is that people started, um, as soon as it started, they started distrusting the convention. We, we in Chile have a problem of, of uh, very low levels of trust in institutions. Um, they, some, it has gone up, uh, but, but it's still very low. And, and that started immediately. Well, the, the first day of the convention was, was, was a difficult day. Um, the, they were the, there was a children's orchestra that was playing the national anthem. They started protests. People started shouting. The kids were crying. So, so it was a hard day. Um, but then you saw that people started taking a distance from the convention in the polls. And, and it was interesting to see how the convention sort of got distance from the people as well. Like you saw a lot of people saying, look, we don't trust, we don't trust. And they were like, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. They had time to change um, what they're working on because they knew that there was an exit referendum. And I would say that uh, they real those who saw that, they saw it um, way too late. And many of, of them didn't see it um, until the exit referendum. Um, and in the middle of it, we had presidential elections. So this has been a very intense year in Chile. So in the middle of the Constitutional Convention, this was not planned originally, uh, this change because of COVID, um, but you had a presidential election and in the first round, um, you got the candidate from the left and from the far right. So it was very different from what was happening in the convention. Trust in institutions or rather lack of trust in institutions is not just a Chilean problem. Uh, it, it is a problem in most democracies, certainly in the Americas and in Europe. Do you think trust has gone up or down after the rejection of the proposed constitution? Oh, that's a good question. I've, I haven't seen the polls um, on that specifically. It's interesting. For example, um, when the social outburst uh, was at its peak, one of the main affected institutions was um, the police. The police had had corruption scandals before, the years before. So it was decreasing over the years. And then the social outburst came and it was, um, of course, a terrible time in Chile and, 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 and particularly uh, in, with uh, the police force issues. Um, but now the police force has gone up. Trust in the police force. Yes, and so, so, so it, it um, the same has happened with with the armed forces. Um, in Chile, normally, the in terms of uh, political authorities, um, local governments have higher um, trust than, for example, Congress or the government. The problem is that we see we live in a presidential country, and so you need a strong government. Um, and so um, I would say that this idea of, an, of a 
it's not it's 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 a, a low level of functioning of the political system in general government and congress is something that is um that has a lot of effect on trust um what i've studied is that in chile at least and and you see this in other countries of latin america as well um corruption affects trust immediately so corruption scandals have a huge effect uh, but also um less effective services, public services. I mean, if you go to a hospital and you get a bad um, experience, if, if you go to get, I don't know, your national identification number and you have to wait for hours, uh, and, and that I think is something that we, we have still to solve um, in Chile and in many other countries as well. Um, none of those issues are constitutional, or many of those issues are not constitutional. Uh, and I think that's why I said it at the beginning. We tended to look everything from the constitutional perspective. And I think there's much more to do besides that discussion. And I'm a lawyer and I study the constitution and I work with it. So what is your hope for the next round? There will be some kind of process. Uh, they will go back to work in an effort to produce a new, new constitution. Are you optimistic? And the stakes are higher. The stakes are higher. You, you, we went through a process and it failed. I don't think we can fail again. And it well, there's two again. possibilities. One is that you succeed, and one is that you fail. If, of course, if it, of course. But but the stakes are higher in terms of we need to get it right this time. Like sixty two percent voted against it. We need a high number of approval for the next one. So that forces us to engage in it in a, in, a, in a super straight way, I would say. And in practice, does that mean a more focused, narrow gauge effort? This constitution, the rejected constitution, did have perhaps too many issues in it. Glaciers probably have rights, but I'm not sure you really need it in the constitution in order to assure that uh, the environment's not abused. How do, how do you narrow this? 388 you... articles. I rest my case. Well, it's, it's not easy. Um, I would say that we need much more negotiation within the, the future assembly, and that requires political parties. I know that political parties do not enjoy trust here everywhere, I mean, uh, but they've they play a fundamental role um, in terms of putting together different interests. We have uh, many problems and many interests, but but you have to put together a coherent um, proposal, um, and that requires negotiation. Um, and 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 doing that one by one, it's impossible. And, and so I, I, I have a case for political parties. I know it's not popular, uh, but we need a f to put together a functioning um, proposal. And the other thing is that we probably agree on less issues than we would like. And, and that's important to acknowledge. Maybe, and, I, I, and this is my view, we should leave um the the issues that we don't agree on for for politics that's the role of politics um but but this idea that this is it uh if we don't put it now then we're lost um at the end it, it becomes a problem because it's one idea and then it's the next and the next and the next and the next and 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 we have discussions as any other country has but you need a, a document that allows for political discussion on a pluralistic and diverse society. Um, of course, I'm much worried on the institutional side, uh, and 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 I think we we need to put that on. But it's those are boring and issues, and and those are not very popular in the discussion. But but I think that's part of the the role of of the people that work in the universities as well. Two final questions. The first is easier than the second. Do you expect this to work? You said it has to work, but that's different from 
you can see how it can be made to work? I'm, I'm optimistic, and this might sound weird. Um, I'm optimistic in the sense that um, we're not putting all the eggs in that basket anymore. I'm optimistic because a constitutional process can address so many problems, but it cannot solve all the issues that we have in a society. So the first exercise was super therapeutic. Um, we had to say things and people sort of put forward their case and, and it was very um, visual, as I mentioned before. And I think, um, I hope that the next exercise is much more boring in a sense, in the sense that we, we, we get to what we need to address, which, is, which are many things. We need to make a constitution for the next 50 years. And that, of course, needs to address climate change. Of course, it needs to address gender. Um, but but it's, it's, it has... I, I wish that it doesn't concentrate all the focus of everything. Um, and in Chile, there's many other th issues that are happening. We have a difficult economic situation. We have a difficult discussion on violence and crime. Um, so many other things are happening. I'm optimistic in the sense that, yes, uh, the, the next constitutional process will be what it can be. It can be everything. Uh, it can't be everything. Um, and, and that's why, and I think now, because of what happened, um, the political parties will sort of engage much more with, with this process. So my final question, and it is certainly unfair, is what lessons should the rest of us whose democracies are also struggling learn from what Chile has gone through and is going through, as, it, as you've just described, as the country continues to wrestle with defining a future constitutional framework? What lessons? Um, maybe... Let, let, let me put forward some ideas, not lessons. Um, I would say the first, the role of political parties, which is a discussion that is everywhere. Um, we tend to look at them as something that everybody dislikes and that they are over now. And I would say that um, we should look again at that discussion. The second one I would say is the idea of the impact of not solving problems or, or addressing the issues uh, when we need to. I think that played a huge role in, the, in our discussion because they were long-lasting issues and because people are fed up with, with, with non-functioning solutions, we went all in into the constitutional process. So I think that that's, that's maybe if we had addressed the pension system or the, uh, the health system, that could be much more channeled. Um, another thing I would say is um, that a huge um, challenge that we have is how to make the political system more inclusive without it becoming fragmented. So we talk about gender, we talk about um, different minorities, we talk about uh, indigenous peoples in our case, um, but, the, but how do we bring these changes to the political system, political parties, Congress, government, whatever, uh, without it becoming a kaleidoscope of people? Uh, and I think that's, that's difficult. You need to address electoral system. You need to address internal rules of political parties. You need to, if not, um, we saw... Um, the cost that it has, um, and, and, and it can become a backlash, right, against these ideas. And I, I don't think that's the way, but I think um, that's a huge tension that we're seeing here and in other places, and the answer is not obvious. And finally, I would say that it's the role of social media. I think we have not studied it um, deeply, uh, how it is changing not only um, the access to representatives and, and the authorities, but mainly political debate. Um, and I, I think that's, that's huge 
maybe not so much for us, but for the younger generations, how they get the news, how they process what they see, uh, what types of people do they follow um, uh, to get informed. And I think uh, that's, that's a question for democracy everywhere. So thanks again, Isabel, uh, and two counts, I think. One, not only for this conversation, which is very enlightening, but secondly, on behalf of the rest of us, for the process that Chile is willing to go through. You are the lab rats of democracy. Uh, if you can make it work, maybe the rest of us can do so as well. So we'll revisit this as you go into the future, as the country makes decisions, and hopefully next time, uh, the people of Chile agree that the experts got it right. Thank you. And and may I say that um, this is something that someone you know told me, uh, that the exit referendum, you can see it, of course, as a failure of the process and, and the process failed. But it's also um, a, a win for for democracy. You had a big, big election uh, people participated. The results were not challenged. Uh, and we're going again. again. So I guess institutions uh, are necessary here and everywhere. Democracy works. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at Talberg Foundation. Org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>